frankincense, sandalwood, lavender, myrrh. These are the words of power, the most ancient form of the occult arts, herb magic. Hello, I'm Scott Cunningham. For the next hour, I'll be your guide into the world of incenses, oils, and brews. Thanks for coming along for the journey, and I hope you enjoy this introduction to green magic. Now, I've written several books on the subject and planned several more. The books are limited to words and pictures. In this video, I'll show you how to do some of these facets of herb magic so that you can see them actually being done. The best way to learn is by doing. And I hope this video will help others to learn and investigate the practices of herb magic. If you think this idea is absurd, the fact that tiny plants can possess amazing powers, think of the white willow. For centuries, herbalists used its powers to relieve muscle pain and spasms. Then science discovered that it actually did relieve pain, and this is still used as a basic ingredient in aspirin. Herbs contain real powers and energies which work on both the physical and the spiritual realms. But don't take my word for it. Try out a few of the simple herbal spells shown here. You'll know by your results if herb magic is effective. Herbs are usually strongly scented, a clue to their powers. Now, magic is a ritual process in which we direct natural forces to bring about needed changes into manifestation. Does that sound vague? Well, yes, it is vague. Magic is as hard to define as electricity or love, neither of which is completely understood by scientists. I don't know everything about magic, but I know how to make it work. In natural magic, you achieve an understanding of it which can never be shared in words. Now, putting together these two definitions, herb magic is the use of little-known powers of nature to cause needed change. These energies are aroused, attuned, released, and directed towards the magical goal. There are many ways of accomplishing this, and some of these will be shown here. Now, if you want to practice herb magic, keep one thing perfectly in mind. This is an absolutely natural practice. There's nothing supernatural about it, for how can anything be outside of nature? Nature is all. Magic, magic is an organic art. Well, this doesn't mean we eat granola while casting spells, uh, though this perhaps does happen. No, magic is a cooperative process between the earth and the magician. Since magic is natural, it possesses its own set of laws. Not rules and regulations, but the results of centuries of observation. For example, herb magic usually isn't instantaneous. Just tying a money sachet around your neck won't materialize a thousand dollar bill in your pocket. What it will do is surround you with money attracting energies. Now these energies combined with your own involvement with your need will draw money to you. Similarly, though a love oil might not attract your ideal mate overnight, it will widen your options, eventually leading you to him or her. Magic can be fun, but it should be done with serious intent. Doing an incense spell, for instance, just for fun, will produce no results. However, the same spell, when performed with serious intent and emotional involvement, can have fantastic results. And while it's perfectly acceptable to work magic for your own gain, selfishly manipulating or hurting others is not. Obviously, just like in real life. Practitioners of harmful magic eventually wind up in psychological or metaphysical ruin. Now think for a minute. In most of the movies you've seen, hasn't the evil magician ended up fried to a crisp? It's usually the case. So know that magic works, that it should be done with serious intent, and it isn't used to harm others. It also works along natural lines. How does it work? Through vibrations. This plant contains a huge store of energies waiting to be released through your touch and magical intent. The plants in your garden, the weeds growing through the sidewalks, the flowers in the jar on the table, all are storehouses of energy. It's possible to feel these energies. Those of us naturally psychic will have a little trouble feeling them, but anyone can with practice. Take any living plant. Rub your palms together for a few seconds. Shake them off as if they were wet, and then hold them a few inches above the plant. It is beaming out its energies to you. You may feel them as waves of heat, pulses of energy, or simply as a sort of hum. Your palms may tingle or vibrate. 
These are all reactions to the plant's powers. Try this exercise once a day for a week using a different type of plant each day and note their varying levels of energy. In their own way, plants speak to us. Each plant possesses distinct powers. Each type of plant possesses equally distinct energies. Some plants, such as garlic, have strong authoritative powers and so are used in spells of this nature, protection, exorcism, things like that. Others, like roses, have gentler vibrations and stimulate the love centers of the brain. These are used in such spells. You can discover all these varying energies within plants on your own by working daily with herbs. Or get a good book and read up on herbs, then experiment to see if you agree with the author's information. In the past, magic was ruled by the heavens. Herbs were collected according to lunar phases. Constellation's first appearance on the horizon was greeted by specific spells, and planetary positions dictated certain rites. While this is still true today, many magicians share the view that since the powers at work in magic, plants, stones, the earth, our own energies, are linked to universal energies, and indeed are manifestations of these universal, universal energies, perfect magical timing isn't necessary. Some think otherwise based on experience. That's fine for them. I just feel that though timing can help a spell, even just by keying into the magician's imagination through ritual associations, perfect magical timing isn't necessary. Harvesting herbs is an important part of magical herbalism. In a sense, when you harvest a plant, you're asking it to give up its life to further your own magical goals. So it's important to attune and respect the life force within the plant before harvesting it. One of the ways we can do this is to make a sacrifice by burying something precious or semi-precious at the base of the plant prior to harvesting. Here I am planting an amethyst crystal to give power and strength to the plant as I cut it. You can also attune with the plant by just touching it and feeling its energies and letting them mix and mingle with yours to attune with it before you ask it to make its sacrifice. After that, take a knife, it needn't be one like this, and cut very gently sprigs of the plant. It's very important not to cut or collect plants or collect from plants or herbs that grow by polluted or stagnant water by busy roadways, anywhere where they may have been sprayed with pesticides or chemicals, and never collect more than 25% of the plant's growth or from very young plants. Harvesting herbs is basically the beginning of magical herbalism because once you ask the plant to give up part of its life for your magic, you, are begun, you have begun to attune with the earth and with the powers at work behind herb magic. A few tools necessary to practice herb magic they aren't expensive or difficult to find, you can probably find most of them at your local store. This is a mortar and pestle, perfect for grinding herbs to a powder. Next, a sensor, or an incense burner, necessary for burning incense. Candles, of course, are a necessary tool in herb magic, for the power of flame and color is potent and easily combines with herb power. You'll also need some large wooden or ceramic bowls for mixing. They can be of any material. Eyedroppers are very important for mixing oils and try to get bottles with eyedroppers attached. It makes it much easier. You'll also need many pieces of flannel or felt cloth of various colors. Also, natural fiber cords or yarn. It's also a good idea to keep a book of herbal notes, records of spells, and also the formulas you invent or change. This book in time will be worth more to you than any you could buy in any store. Prior to using herbs in magic, it's best to grind them. Drying herbs activates their energies to a certain extent, but some are lost as well. Grinding herbs activates their magical energies. Add any herbs, such as this dragon's blood, to the mortar and pestle. Now, after scrunching up a little bit, begin grinding in a clockwise motion. 
In magic, clockwise motions are thought to imbue the herb with positive vibrations. Counterclockwise motions are thought to imbue it with negative energies. It's easy to stick with a clockwise motion, and in magic it's best to do so. Continue grinding until you've reduced the herb to a powder. Some herbs grind quite easily, like this dragon's blood does. And most herbs, such as rosemary, things like that, frankincense and other herbs are really a problem. They usually start sticking and mucking up the mortar and pestle while you grind them. And so a very light touch is required. After a few minutes, the herbs should be ground to a powder, and it's ready to be used in magic. Incense, magic smoke, smoldering herbs and spices, oils and bark. Sense of magic, incenses to change your life. For centuries, witches and magicians have used incense and magic to strengthen the effects of spells and rituals. Powerful recipes were once kept secret and were rarely passed to others. When these incenses were burned in ritual, they drew love, money, power, and protection to the magician, drove out evil and sickness, and enhanced spirituality and psychic awareness. Okay, let's make a protection incense. You'll need rosemary, cedar, and juniper berries. All these herbs have been ground. We're going to make granulated or powdered incense. This is the easiest type to make and the most used in magic. Sticks, cones, and blocks are fine, but are difficult to make without practice. Start with the powdered forms first. Once the herbs are ground, they are enchanted. This implies to all forms of herb magic. Enchanting or attuning herbs reaffirms the energies you've aroused during the grinding process. You can enchant each herb separately or mixed together. For time considerations, here, I'll enchant them collectively. You decide what works best for you. Pour each, her pour each herb into a mixing bowl, keeping in mind the eventual purpose of the herb product, in this case, protection. Now. Rub your hands briskly together to sensitize them above, above the bowl. Start running your fingers through the herbs in the bowl, mixing them, blending their energies as you continue to visualize your magical goal. While doing this, visualize or imagine your fingers streaming with your own energies. With your imagination, charge this energy with protection, since this is a protection incense. This energy mixes with that of the herbs, and as you continue to mingle the herbs, they absorb this power. Mix until you feel the herbs tingling or vibrating. If you wish, chant a simple rhyme which encapsulates the energies you need in the final product. Once you know the herbs are glowing and radiating energy, that's it. The incense is made. Now to burn it. You can burn it as part of a larger spell or simply use it as a ritual in and of itself. You need a sensor, an incense burner, as well as a charcoal block. This isn't the kind you use in the barbecue, but a specially made charcoal for in incense use. These are available at religious supply stores or by mail from one of the retailers shown at the end of this video. If you can't find a suitable sensor, take any bowl and half fill with sand. This makes a fine sensor. Now, light the charcoal block. As you do this, it will start to sputter and glow. Quickly place it in the sensor and wait until the sputtering and glowing has stopped. Mm. If you don't like the smoke this causes, hold the block next to an open window. If you have a particular protective or other spell to perform, set up the required objects, pour on the incense, and begin. Or simply place white candles on either side of the sensor, add some incense to the charcoal block, and visualize. Fingers, a spoon, or any incense spoon can be used to uh, place the incense on the charcoal block itself. Fingers aren't best because it's difficult to actually accurately place the incense on the block. Spoons give get greater control. As you light the charcoal block and add the incense to it, you are keeping in the spell in mind, visualizing protective concepts or objects. And that's about it. Let the smoke rise until it stops, then add a bit more incense to the charcoal. Repeat this until you're satisfied the incense has done its work. All this time, you're still focusing your mind toward the incense's goal. If, for example, you're needing oh, personal protection, see the smoke swirling around you to form a protective film or shield against which no negativity can cross. If guarding the home, car, or another person, visualize accordingly. Here are four more incense recipes for you to try. With experimentation, you'll discover your own blends. Power incense is burned when the magician needs extra energy for spells and rites. Luck incense is used as a gentle purification incense and also to charge your luck, change your luck from bad to good. Burn with concentration and vow to put yourself in lucky situations. Burn wishing magic incense when performing wish spells or during any kind of magical rite. 
To attract a passionate love, burn this incense before a night on the town. Proper use of the sensor is an important tool. With a swinging sensor, you have greater control over its motion. There are three basic ways to move the sensor, in a clockwise circle, a counterclockwise circle, and a side-to-side -side swing. Clockwise or diosal swings invite positive vibrations, deities, and energy. This is used to bless or consecrate for protection and other positive types of magic. Counterclockwise or Wittishan's motions dispel negativity and are used in exorcisms, banishings, and purifications. Most Wittishan sensor movements are immediately followed up with diosal or clockwise swings to cancel out the negative energies which inevitably remain. Side-to-side -side motions are often used at altars to invoke goddesses and gods, ancestral spirits, or elemental forces. It's important to practice until you can perform the swing with these, otherwise you may have your sensor spilling its charcoal onto the floor. When sensing rooms in an entire house, move slowly from room to room, swinging the sensor and replenishing the incense when necessary. Of course, you needn't swing the sensor at all. For many rites, it's more important for the sensor to remain on the altar or between flaming candles. But when sensor movement is required or desired, you'll know how to do it. Work with incense. It's a powerful tool. Now that we've covered incense, we'll move on to magical sachets, also known as herbal amulets and talismans. In herb magic, a sachet is a piece of cloth filled with enchanted herbs and tied shut with a cord. Magical sachets are a convenient way to capture and gently release the powers of herbs. They can be worn, placed behind objects, in the home, under your pillow, up your chimney. The range of possibilities are limited only by your imagination. For sachets, you'll need a good supply of colored flannel or felt. Eight to 10 colors are a good basic selection, but I have five here for demonstration purposes. You'll also need some cord or yarn of the matching colors, preferably wool or cotton, but synthetics will do. For amulets to wear or carry, use a four or five inch square piece of cloth. For household use, an eight or nine inch square is fine. Right now, we'll make up a third eye sachet, one designed to boost your own psychic powers. This sachet can be worn around the neck or held while scrying in the crystal, working with the tarot, tossing the I Ching, or placed beneath the pillow for prophetic dreams. We'll need bay, yarrow, lemongrass, marigold, and mace for the sachet. After enchanting each herb, add them to the mixing bowl. As you enchant, visualize yourself as having perfect control over your psychic powers. If you're making the sachet for a friend, visualize him or her doing this. Then, once the herbs are humming with power, transfer them with your fingers to the center of the cloth. Do this while still really seeing yourself having complete control over your psychic awareness. Next, still visualizing, pull the ends of the cloth together, trapping the herbs inside tightly. Then tie them with a cord of the same color, not three or so times. Um, I'm in a little trouble with my knots here, but that's okay. Not three or so times, each time strongly seeing yourself or a friend as being psychic. Some people breathe into the sachet before tying it to give it life, but this isn't necessary. The herbs already should be humming and vibrating with the tuned powers after their enchantment. Now the sachet is complete. You can trim off the ends of the cloth or leave them as they are. There are many possible variations. Gemstones, feathers, and other magical objects can be added. Sachets can also be anointed with magical oils. Hold the sachet. Feel its vibration. Squeeze it gently to release its powers. Now carry it with you, or place in the home, or use during psychic sessions. Here are four more sachets for you to try. They're made in the same way. More recipes can be found in the magic of incense, oils, and brews. When you feel you're in need of magical protection, make and carry a flaming protection sachet. When you're feeling blue, or to remain healthy, make and wear a Mexican health sachet. Wear a two-heart sachet to bring a love into your life. If you're feeling sad or depressed, wear the happiness sachet to lift your spirits. Right now, we're going to do a lemon and pin spell. This is a protective spell for the home utilizing a green or unripe lemon and comes from Italian folklore. You'll need, as I said, a green or unripe lemon. This isn't the yellow lemons you buy in the store, and it isn't a lime either, although it sort of looks like a lime. No, this is a lemon you have to get from a friend who has a lemon tree. So if you have one, 
If you have a lemon tree or a friend who has one, latch onto it because you definitely need it for this spell. You'll also need some colored pins. Now, these are pins with different colors on the heads. They usually have glass heads and try to get the glass ones and not the plastic ones. Although the glass is more expensive, the plastic is less organic. So, first of all, take the lemon in your hands and put power into it. Enchant it or empower it as we talked about earlier on this tape. Visualize while you're holding the lemon protective energy streaming from it and filling the house or wherever it's placed. Once you've empowered or enchanted the lemon, you can start piercing it with the pins. So as you place each pin and push it in about halfway, again, reaffirm the visualization within your mind. See this as being a huge lock or brilliant purple streams of energy which actually burn away all negativity and completely cover and stud the lemon with pins until it looks something like this. So it looks like a satellite, doesn't it? A Sputnik or something? Well, this is a powerful protectant for the home. Now after about six or eight months, it will have dried and shrunk to something that resembles this, which again isn't exactly attractive, but it does guard the home and its possessions. Once you're done with it, put a larger pin on the top of it, attach a red ribbon or yarn, and hang it up in the home. That's Lemon and Pin Spell. Another way to use herbs and herb magic is by making something called herbal petitions. In a sense, this is sort of like an amulet or a magical sachet that's burned. You'll need a piece of paper about like this and a colored pen or a charred stick like this to create a symbol which represents your magical need. In this case, money, because how many of us don't need extra money? Okay, what you basically need to do is draw that image on this piece of paper, again, while visualizing your magical goal. Since we're doing money here, I'll be visualizing myself as having money. After drawing the symbol, you need to enchant herbs. Now, since this is a money ritual or a money petition, I've ground and enchanted cloves, patchouli, and vervain, three herbs long associated with money. Okay, so after enchanting the herbs, take the piece of paper on which you've inscribed the symbol and transfer some of the enchanted herbs to the center of the paper, like so. Now carefully fold up the paper, trapping the herbs inside of it. And now the only thing that's left is to light it. Light it on fire and burn it up into ashes. When you light something on fire, you change its physical structure. And in magic, you're releasing the energies locked within the object, in this case, the herbs and the paper and the symbol, and letting them go out and bring your need into manifestation. There's the Now, as the petition burns, visualize the powers of the herbs at work. You can do herbal petitions just like we did here with any of the formulas included in this video. Uh, incenses, amulets, powders, any of them can work with the herbal petition. And it's a real powerful magical spell. Try it out, see if it works. Herbs are often found growing near water. One of these includes celery. The seeds are eaten to promote concentration. Watercress, used in money spells. Cattails, which are worn by women in sachets to increase enjoyment of sex. The lotus, a protective flower known since ancient Egyptian times. And the papyrus, carried to increase mental powers and to stimulate creativity. are a wonderful way to capture the powers of herbs. But there is another process available for us to use. It's called tincturing or maceration. In tincturing, we use 90, 192 proof alcohol or ethyl alcohol to capture the powers and essences of herbs. Now this isn't the rubbing alcohol you buy in the drugstore. It is definitely grain alcohol, generally sold in the United States as Everclear, although it is available down in Tijuana under other names. If you do find some 192 
try it out, try some tinctures, and see if they work for you. The process is quite simply simple. Simply take the 192 proof alcohol and pour it over herbs. Just barely cover the herbs. Don't drown them. Don't let them swim. It shouldn't look like you're making herb soup. Then cork, uh, tightly cork the bottle and shake it every day for about two weeks and let it sit. After that time, when you take off the top and smell it, it should smell like the herbs. Once you've made the tincture, it's really easy to use. Simply add a couple drops to your bath, anoint your body with it, maybe put a couple drops on an herbal petition or an herbal amulet. Uh, you might also anoint jewelry or altars or any sort of magical objects with the tinctures themselves. And that's it, magical tinctures. They're easy and they work. Sage is available in a wide variety of species. American Indians burned sage and wafted its smoke onto their bodies for purification. It is used in cleansing baths and incenses. The leaves are also crushed and rubbed onto the body to help speed its healing abilities. Empower a green candle with money attracting vibrations. Empower sage with the same vibrations and then place in a ring around the candle. Burn the candle to increase your wealth. A wishing spell can also be performed with sage. Write your wish on a sage leaf. Place this beneath your pillow and sleep on it for three nights. If you dream of your wish, it will come to pass. If not, bury the leaf and try it again. Rosemary is an ancient plant with numerous magical properties. Add some to the bath for purification. Ring pink candles with this herb to draw love. Hang from your doorpost to guard the home from thieves. Tuck some rosemary in your pocket to promote healing. Spearmint is another herb with magical, not necessarily medicinal, healing properties. It is worn, used in herbal amulets are added to the bath water for these purposes. Smell fresh spearmint to sharpen mental powers. If you have trouble sleeping, nightmares, or perhaps feel you may be subject to attacks, psychic or otherwise, during your sleep, place some fresh spearmint beneath the pillow or mattress. Or sleep on a pillow made of dried spearmint for this purpose. Wormwood is a powerful magical herb. Related to mugwort, it can be a bit dangerous if taken internally, so it's best to use it in external applications and magic. Wormwood is often worn for protection, just like mugwort. It's also placed under the pillow to attract love. The castor bean is a very familiar plant to many people, maybe not in its looks but in its applications, castor oil is pressed from the seeds, often called beans. In magic, castor beans or seeds are used for protective purposes. They're carried or placed in sachets for this reason, but since they're very, very poisonous without proper processing, please don't take them internally. Thyme is another plant used in health and healing type spells. Smell the rich odor of freshly crushed thyme to clear your head and to lend energy to your body. Thyme is also placed beneath the pillow to ensure restful sleep and to prevent nightmares. Pillows are often stuffed with thyme for the same purpose of preventing nightmares. Wearing thyme stimulates communication between the psychic and conscious minds. Catnip, of course, is uh, used to stimulate cats. It almost intoxicates them. It's sacred to the ancient Egyptian goddess Bast, or Bast, cat goddess, also known as Bastet and all sorts of different names. And it's also used in basic healing types of spells.
recognize this flower? Probably looks like an iris, right? Well, it is. This special type of iris is called the orris. The root is powdered and added to love incenses or sprinkled on the sheets and rubbed on the body to bring love. Growing the flower in your garden spreads loving vibration throughout your property. If you wish, construct a pendulum by attaching a cord to a piece of the dried orris root and use this to contact the subconscious or psychic mind. Orris can also be added to any psychic type sachet or incense. For a quick whorehound spell, add some to your pocket for protection. Tansy is an ancient plant, often carried to promote love. Many peoples have also worn tansy to lengthen the lifespan. Hey, that looks like Angelica. Yeah, it's a great herb. So it looks like celery, doesn't it? It's used for healing, visions, exorcism, and protecting the home. This feathery green plant is known as yarrow. Yarrow has an ancient magical history. Carried, the fragrant flowers of this plant send out love vibrations and also help to attract new friends. Therefore, the flowers can be added to any sort of love sachets or amulets. A tea made from the flowers of this plant, when drunk, stimulates psychic powers. This green plant is known as mugwort. Mugwort isn't as bizarre as it sounds. Mug simply means mother, and wart, W-O-R-T, means herb. Mugwort, when stuffed into a pillow and slept upon, produces vivid psychic dreams. Ruled by the moon, it is also burned with sandalwood during scrying sessions when you look into a quartz crystal sphere. And a brew of mugwort is used to wash quartz crystal spheres or magic mirrors to heighten their abilities to tap our psychic minds. Mugwort is often placed near the bed or worn to promote healing and is carried for protection. Recognize this plant? No, not the bird. The bird's a peacock. Ivy is a potent household guardian. Grown in the home, or even a piece of it placed in the home, it protects and guards everyone within it. This is sandalwood. You've probably never seen it in this form before. This includes blocks, chunks of the wood, and also various products carved of sandalwood. Sandalwood is an, is an herb with ancient spiritual associations. It's often used in protection, healing, and exorcism type of spells. It's burned it during seances and during full moon rituals, often mixed with frankincense for this purpose. Powdered sandalwood can be scattered around a place to clear it of negativity and is often used as an incense base. This is a very rare herb called wood aloes. It took me years to find some, and I finally found it here in San Diego. It's usually expensive, but well worth the cost. Anciently, the wood aloes was burned to attract good fortune, and was also used in incenses and magical ev evocatory rites during the Renaissance. These were rituals designed to bring about an actual physical manifestation of a spirit. This isn't my bag, but some people are in into things like this. This is dragon's blood. No, 
is not the blood of a dragon. It's actually the resin from a tree that grows in the Middle East. Dragon's blood is used in protective rituals, is used in rituals designed to attract love. It's added to other incenses to increase their potency and power, and is burned as an incense to drive away evil or negativity from the place in which it is burned. Bet you don't know what this is. <laughs> it's camphor. Now most of the camphor sold in the United States is artificial. This is genuine camphor. Camphor comes from the Far East. It's from Malaysia, China, places like that. And this is a substance distilled from the roots of the wood itself. Camphor is used in healing type of spells. It can be added to healing sachets and amulets. A bit of it can be burned, although it's rather strong. And some people carry camphor to ward off colds. Copal is a herb, uh, actually a gum from a tree that grows in Mexico in Central America. I consider copal to be a new world substitute for frankincense. And it can be used for all the different various purposes that frankincense is used for. Spicy carnation, sweet rose, bitter geranium, resinous lavender. Oils are liquid herb essences containing all their powers and magical effectiveness. Sensor aromas may be summed up as vibrations we detect through our sense of smell. True rosemary oil, for instance, contains most of the energies that the fresh herb itself does. Thus, either the herb itself or its oil can be used in magic with equal effectiveness. I'm talking about natural oils here, or rather oils that have been extracted from plant materials by steam distillation alcohol extraction, and by other methods. Although you can find a large variety of so-called essential oils in gift shops and other stores, few if any of these are unadulterated, and many are completely synthetic. It takes a trained nose to tell the true from the false in oils, the full strength from the diluted. But unless you're prepared to spend several hundred dollars on quality oils, use the ones that feel right to you. They seem to smell the way nature intended. That's most important. Hundred dollar an ounce oils are more effective magically because they are true plant oils. But use what you can find, or if you're adventurous, make up a few. You can do this by using a variation of enfleurage, a process whereby the essential oils of flowers or leaves are transferred to a fat or oil. Using a clear, lightly scented oil, such as apricot or safflower, you create a scented oil, not a pure plant oil, but with luck and practice it can come close, and it certainly is magically effective. To make your own oils, you need a large supply of fresh or dried flowers, leaves, or seeds. Scented oils can be made of one ingredient or a combination of several. It's best to start with one herb first. You'll also need a large open mouth jar with a tight fitting lid, cheesecloth, and a good base oil, such as apricot, safflower, or sesame. Don't use olive oil, its scent is too heavy for good results. In my book, Magical Herbalism, I described this process but didn't include the cheesecloth. Since the oil has to be strained periodically, the cheesecloth makes this much easier. Now fill the cheesecloth with enough flowers or leaves to fill the jar. It depends uh, basically how big of a jar you use, uh, how much flowers you actually need, but this is good for our demonstration purposes. Now put the cheesecloth into the jar and cover it with a light base oil, such as safflower or, um, or apricot. I actually probably should have used more petals, but this is fine for now. Now, place the jar in a warm place out of the sun for three to five days or until the oil has absorbed all the herbs essential oils. Like that. After three to five days, carefully remove the cheesecloth from the jar and squeeze it to remove most of the oil that is soaked into the plant material. Then smell it. 
it should have picked up a light scent. Remove the flowers from the cloth, refill with the same quantity of fresh materials, and put it back into the jar. Cap and let sit for three to five days. If this is repeated several times, the number varies with dif different herbs, the oil should become heavily saturated with the plant scent. After the final straining, bottle and label the oil. It is now ready for use in magic. If you don't want to start making your own scented oils, simply buy them and use them in magic. Oils intended for aromatherapy are usually legitimate plant oils. A number of lines of oils are available at stores or by mail. Making magical oils is as easy as making powdered incense. Building up a good stock of oils is perhaps the hardest part, whether you make them yourself or purchase them. Once you have a good selection of 10 to 20 oils, you can start mixing up magical blends. You can, of course, buy magical blends in stores, and the products are of varying quality, from very good to poor. These can be used in magic, of course, but enchant them prior to using. Use your intuition when selecting oils in shops. The same is true with incense and all magical herb products. Although I enjoy making my own, I still do buy them, too. A good selection of oils to start out with includes carnation, rosemary, lavender, lemon, rose geranium, myrrh, cinnamon, sandalwood, jasmine, gardenia, clove, rose, and tuberose. You'll buy more as you need them for various recipes. For oil, oil blending, you'll also need four or five eyedroppers, several small glass bottles with tight-fitting lids, and a mixing bottle or two. If you use bottles that have eyedroppers attached, available from medical supply stores, you can save having to buy separate eyedroppers. But what about enchanting oils? Well, unlike incenses, oils are enchanted after they are blended. We'll make up a healing type of oil. Of course, no magical oil or spell is a replacement for conventional medical treatment. Healing magic works in conjunction with orthodox medicine. A physical problem is usually a symptom of a spiritual problem, and healing magic works to solve the physical and the spiritual problems, thereby speeding the healing process. To use a simplified example, cleaning and dressing a wound with a plantain leaf or a gauze and a commercial antibacterial cream is preferred to chanting spells. Perform the necessary first aid or get medical help, and then use magic to restore, restore the body to normal. OK, back to the oils. This Heal Now oil requires three ingredients, rose, carnation, and rosemary oil. You'll notice I rarely give amounts of ingredients in my recipes. Part of this is tradition. Many were passed to me this way. Also, there's room for personal experimentation and taste in oil and incense composition. If a recipe said to add one part of the first ingredient and you thought that was too much, you'd probably change it. Because of this tendency, I usually don't include amounts in my recipes. Feel free to mix until your intuition tells you the scent is right. As you mix, note the amounts and the proportions of the oils on a note card or in your herbal notebook. If you do create a wonderful variation on a recipe, you'll be able to make up another batch using the same formula. If not, you'll be able to modify it further according to your notes. OK, take your mixing bottle and place it before you. With an eyedropper, add 10 to 20 drops of rosemary oil. Fifteen is good enough. This should be the dominant scent. Why? Well, because rosemary is a strong herb. Looking at the recipes, you'll eventually know intuitively which should be the dominant scent. Now, add six to 12 drops carnation oil. If you're using separate eyedroppers, do use a, a new eyedropper for each oil, because otherwise all the eyedroppers will get mixed up with the oils from the various uses. Something like that. I don't know. Swirl the bottle gently clockwise, strong enough to mix the oils, but not strong enough to cause bubbles and foam in the bottle. Now smell it. If it seems right, fine. If not, add more carnation until the amount is right. Remember to record each ingredient's amounts on a card or in your herbal notebook. Mix it if you've added more, and then sniff again. Do you feel something, perhaps an energy or a rush of power to your head? Good. That's the power of the herbs and oils coming at you. It's still raw and unrefined, but with time it will mellow and grow in power. Seems pretty good. Now we'll add some rose oil. Let's say half as much as the carnation. Two, three, four. Close enough. Swirl it again and then smell it. Not bad. It smells resinously, spicy, and sweetly floral. If the scent seems right to you and the vibrations of the oil are strong, you've finished your first magical oil. Use the same proportions to make up a larger batch, say one half cup or so. Now enchant it, holding it in your hands and strongly visualizing the oil filled with healing vibrations. Once it's pulsing with power, bottle and label it. 
It is ready for use in magic, but for best results, let it sit for two weeks for the oil's energies to blend. Using this technique to blend all your magical oils, you can build up quite a big stock. Use recipes I give you here are ones you find yourself or create. Store your oils in jars with tight-fitting lids, out of sunshine in a cool place. There are virtually endless ways of using oils in magic. They can be rubbed onto the body to bring their influences inside us, added to bath salts, combined with dry ingredients to make incense, dropped on the magical sachets to intensify their powers, used to mark out magical runes as symbols, applied to candles, which are then burnt, releasing the oil's energies, and so on. Some magicians have a stock of 100 herbs and flower oils with 10 to 20 magical blends. While this is fine for a start, 10 or 12 oils are a good number to start experimenting with. Here are four more recipes you might enjoy. They, like all the recipes in this video, have never before been made public. To foretell future trends, to enhance your natural psychic talents, wear crystal vision oil. For protection from ills and banes of everyday life, wear this oil. Wear Hawaiian love oil when you're seeking a mate. To attune your consciousness to higher planes of awareness, wear spirituality oil. Magical oils don't end there. Several things are sometimes added to oils to boost their powers. Enchanted roots, herbs, or flowers are often added to oil. Orris root and love type oils, cloves and money recipes, frankincense and protective exorcistic and purificatory oils, and so on. Semi-precious stones are also often added. Small pieces of turquoise can be added to protective formulae. Jade to healing, tiny quartz crystals to power formulas, lapis lazuli and happiness oils, moonstone or pink tourmaline for love oils, and so on. Get a good gu basic guidebook on stone magic and go from there. Now, these are the first steps in blending and using magical oils. Keep mixing and smelling, and you'll soon find oil magic becoming a part of your everyday life, for it's the easiest form of herb magic. As I mentioned earlier, one of the ways magical oils are used is in creating bath salts. These are simple to make, magically powerful, and transform each bath into a rite of magic. In a sense, bathing in a tub full of water strewn with magical bath salts is similar to anointing with an oil. As usual, when bath salts are made and used, your mind should be filled, no, consumed with the salt's magical purpose. The basic ingredients are oil, oils and salts. You can use different types of salts. Here I've got baking soda, table salt, and Epsom salt. You can use any combination of these, but I usually keep baking soda as the main ingredient because it leaves the skin feeling softer. In a non-metallic mixing bowl, combine the three salts. I usually make up two to three cups or so, but you can make any amount that you wish. Since there is magic in color, even in food colorings, you might want to consider coloring your bath salts. Tinting your bath salts does increase their magical effectiveness through the powers of color. Of course, the color must be in harmony with the magical product. Here's a quick list. Mixing up these colors is easy by following the directions on the back of the food coloring box. I know this isn't ancient magic, but it works. OK, if you want to color your bath salts, mix the colorings, if two or more are necessary, to create your color in a teaspoon first, and then blend it to the mixed salt. As a demonstration, we're going to make a money bath. Since green is a color I associate with money, we'll color it green. Simply drop five to ten or more drops of coloring onto the salt. Four, five. The amount varies and depends on the amount of salt you're mixing and the intensity of the color you desire. Again, it doesn't really matter as long as you're satisfied with the final product. Now start mixing using a spoon. Blend the color into the salt with a firm hand, and it isn't easy, believe me. It'll take you a few minutes to do this, but eventually the salt will take the color evenly. If it seems a little too light, add more salt. Well, add more oils to the salt. <laughs> when you're finished, it will look something like this. Now we're ready to add the oils. For this money bath salt, we'll need tonka, cedar, clove, and patchouli oils. Using eyedroppers, one for each oil, add from three to six drops of each to the salt. If you space the oil drops on the salt, it makes it much easier to mix it up. I did say from three to six, after all. Use your intuition when adding the oils to the salt, as always in herbal magic. You'll know when the scent's right. Two, uh, just a couple more patchouli, come on. There we go. Okay. 
Now start mixing again. Mix them thoroughly clockwise, of course, concentrating on the bath salt's magical purpose. Here, it's money, and not just money, but on your need for money. See that need being fulfilled and pour all this energy into the salt as you mix it. When you've added all the oils, continue mixing until the salt's completely saturated with the oils. The scent should be quite strong, and this certainly is. And the stronger the scent, the less salt you'll have to use in your baths. If it's a fairly heavy scent, you'll probably, probably can use two or three tablespoons to the bath. If less strong, use more than this. Now that it's fairly thoroughly mixed, enchant the bath salts as I've described in the incense section of this program. Bottle and label it, and, you're finished, and you've finished your first magical bath salts. There are many formulae for magical bath salts, and indeed, any one oil can be used by itself. Carnation bath salts, for example, are useful for increasing your energy and for healing and protective purposes. A simple rose bath salt is fine for attracting a love. As you bathe in the scented water, let your magical need fill your being and feel the oil's powerful vibrations permeating your cells. The bath salts will do their work. Here are four more recipes for magical bath salts. Have fun with them. Bathe with this mixture to bring luck into your life and also as a gentle purificatory rite. When you wish to achieve higher states of consciousness, bathe in this, bathe in this spiritual blend. Purification bath is used as a general cleansing bath prior to ritual. Bathe in love bath to draw interested people to you. Still with me? Great. I thought I'd talk about magical herb powders for a few minutes. In New Orleans magical lore, powders were used to literally spread around the powers of herbs. They're often adulterated with talc, chalk, or even flour, but this isn't necessary or even desirable. Here, all magical powders will be made with just herbs and salt. Powders are a convenient magical tool. Protective powder, for instance, can be sprinkled onto floors and purses or wallets, in your car, wherever you need extra protection. Love powders are rubbed onto the body and sprinkled onto clothing. Healing powders are strewn in the sick room and also placed in the bed. They're quite simple to make. For an all-around protection powder, you'll need rosemary, frankincense, and salt. Of course, the powder, powders, the herbs, should be ground to a powder in the mortar and pestle first. First, I'll powder the frankincense. As always, keeping in mind the powers of the finished product. So while I grind, I visualize protection. And as I continue to grind, I visualize protection. Okay, That's close enough to a powder. <laughs> when I have enough frankincense, I pour it out into the bowl and start grinding the rosemary which I hope will be easier than the frankincense. The herbs should be reduced to the finest possible powder. To do this, you might want to pick out the stems from leafy herbs. For barks and wood, such as sandalwood, you can grind for hours, as I used to do, or you can buy it pre-ground. Well, I think it's going to take several minutes to powder this, so we'll, uh, we'll just wing it. After that, add a couple, about a teaspoon or so of salt to the powder, getting it all over the table, of course and mix it together while enchanting the mixture, infusing it with your power, with your need for protection in this case. After that, it's done. Use it immediately or bottle, label, and store until needed. Powders like oils, bath salts, and sachets can be given to friends who need a magical boost. If you do make them for others, when you enchant, visualize her or him as receiving the benefits of the mixture. I'm sure as you make magical powders, you'll think of new ways to use them and new formulas as well. One of the best uses I've found is to sprinkle your magical altar with the appropriate powder for love rituals, love powder, and then burn the correct incense, the right candles, and so do your spells. Use prosperity powder when you need extra cash or wealth in any form. Sprinkle power powder in your pockets or on the altar for extra magical energies. Love powder is spread on the sheets and rubbed onto the body to draw love. Place a large bowl of healing powder in the sick room and sprinkle in each corner of the room. Hi, right now we're going to do a practice called scrying or herb scrying. In this, we utilize the powers of herbs to strengthen and fine tune the psychic powers which are the gift of all of us. We are all psychic, we all have psychic minds, which is often called the subconscious mind. Unfortunately, uh, visualize this as being the subconscious mind and visualize this hand as being the conscious mind. 
Fortunately, the conscious mind has a firm grip or grasp on the subconscious mind and blocks the psychic signals that are always coming into it. So we can utilize herbs to strengthen our natural psychic powers. To do this, take uh, an herb such as thyme, patchouli, cinnamon, marigold, yarrow, or peppermint. Pour it into your hand, about that much, and again, empower or enchant the herb uh, visualizing yourself as being psychic, visualizing the powers within the herb to help strengthen your, your natural psychic powers. After empowering the herb, scatter it on bare ground or on a plate or on some flat surface. Close your eyes for a few minutes, visualizing yourself as being psychic, as having complete access to your psychic powers, then open your eyes and gaze at the herb itself. After a few minutes, if you're properly attuned and the herb is properly empowered, the patterns, the random patterns produced by the herb will trigger your subconscious mind and allow psychic impulses to come in and contact your conscious mind. When this happens, true communication between the two minds has taken place and psychic awareness has begun. Obviously, herb birds. <clears throat> herb magic is a wonderful practice. It's the most satisfying form of magic I know because it basically is a union between we, the magicians, and nature. And let's face it, nature is our mother. Nature is the universe. Nature is our microcosm. It's our home. And so using herbs, the gifts of, ma of nature, in magic helps us connect with the earth. Herb magic isn't necessarily ecology, but certainly the ideas behind ecology, preserving our planet, very well fit in with the idea of herb magic. these herbs. Fifteen years ago I wondered if they really did contain any powers. I found out. They've changed my life and I hope they change yours as well. Get to know the herbs. Buy them, collect them, grow them. Practice feeling their energies. Record your notes and impressions in your herbal notebook. Work slowly but surely with herbs and soon you'll find yourself wondering why you ever doubted in the first place. Herbs are energies which we can use to improve our lives and the lives of those we know and love. All it takes is actually working with them. The choice is yours, but I hope this tape and my books have, if nothing else, introduced you to a larger world, one in which we work in harmony with natural energies to transform our lives into positive, happy experiences. I'll be talking to you again. Take care. Scott Cunningham's Herb Magic books are available at bookstores everywhere or direct from Llewellyn Publications.